Hey, this is Julio. Hey, this is Steve. Before the podcast starts, we want to welcome and give you the opportunity to support our ministry by visiting our website at www.bridgemanlaredo.org. Scroll down to the bottom of any page and you'll find the PayPal donate button. Bridge Ministries exists to share the glorious good news of Jesus Christ and to equip people to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. If you would like to help us in our mission of making affordable or free Bibles and Christian books available and also to check out the orphanage that we support, visit our website. Call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. 1 Peter 17 through 19. My name is Julio Omad Rodriguez, and we're back with another episode of Bridge Radio. This is episode number 22, and across from me, I have my co host for today, the boss, El Jefe. Hey, hey, this is Steve Denhartog. Good to be with you this uh, afternoon. Yeah. Um, so we're we're back. I'm excited. We got a we got a good podcast for for everyone today. But um, hey, before we get get jumping into this topic, I want to point people back to our last podcast. It was with John Sampson. It went very well. Um, I apologize too about it being very long. We did not expect that podcast to be almost two hours. We told John coming in, hey, uh, forty five minutes at max. That's usually how we like our podcast to be. And it went way past, and there was just so much good testimony, so much good t- content. What did you think about the podcast, Steve? Man, it was good. I think he, he could have gone on for another couple hours, I think, from, from the way he sounded. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it comes to that topic, that's something here at, at the ministry, and especially with John, since he was so immersed with the Word of Faith, Prosperity Gospel, um, we're very passionate about it. Down here, we, we see it quite a bit. And, uh, and the whole point is not to bash. It's, yeah. it's it's just to lead people to the truth and to help them to see of course. see the error. I mean, we need to take all of Scripture, all of God's revelation to us, and uh, not just pick out a few portions that we like and that we can claim. We need to look at it all. Yeah. So I want to point people back to that podcast. If you have family and friends who believe in aspects of the doctrine and theology of the Word of Faith movement, the prosperity gospel, I want to point people to that podcast. It definitely, or it is, uh, it, it passed Jay Warner Wallace's podcast and uh, Gary DeMar's podcast on the All of It Discourse. It's the most viewed podcast, and I keep looking at it every day, and it keeps growing and growing and growing. So mm-hmm. um, it's impacting people. Praise God. We thank you. We thank him for that. And, uh, and yeah, we're probably going to be ending up doing a, a part two, because I know John Sampson kind of has been getting a little little aggressive feedback. So it's it's to be expected. Yeah, it's it's uh, when you... When you bring up the truth there's going to be pushback a lot of times i think uh we expect sharing the the truth and being a witness to the gospel is going to be easy and uh, and jesus himself said it's not easy no it's not uh truth divides when when, i think rc sproul said like whenever you say dogs are better than cats yeah that already divides a line. That already makes people a little hostile than exactly. the, the, them cat people. So, exactly. um, anyway, guys, um, for, if you're listening on iTunes, um, last podcast, or this is just something new that we're implementing, um, if you could go to our reviews on iTunes, drop us a five star review. Um, let us know what you think, uh, positive. And uh, hey, if for that podcast for that week, um, if you uh, if you drop, we'll, we'll pick out whichever ones that are there. Only two though, um, but we will send be sending a travel uh, bridge mug. Uh, built like a tank, keeps your beverage nice and warm. Nice it's, double wall porcelain mug. Yeah, it's it's they're they're very very nice. They're not cheap, so we're sending something you good. It's the original classic logo right. of Bridge. So there's we're we're not going to be making any of those anytime soon. And as well for the second um, uh, shipment or free item, uh, we got. Uh, when was this? We got some books oh, from P and R. It was years ago. Yeah, we got some some books from 
PNR Publishing and mm-hmm. uh, brand new books, really good stuff. So we've got a we've got an excess of them. So yeah, and so we, we we're going to be sending out this free book, the certainty the certainty of the faith, apologetics in an uncertain world, by Richard B. Ramsey, and uh, one of the forwarders or one of the people who. Uh, commended this book and thought it was excellent was uh, Dr. John Frame, who we'll be having on the program in April. There you go. Um, I'm very excited about that. So, no, this is uh, excellent. Um, 1 Peter 3.15, revere Christ as uh, uh, Lord in your heart Mm -hmm. and uh, be ready to give a reasonable defense for the hope that is in you. Amen. And uh, I know this book is by PNR, and so it's nice and reformed and and I know it'll teach uh, someone um, uh, excellent apologetics. So, there's that, guys, and uh, and so yeah. So let's go ahead and jump into today's topic, our yes. podcast. Um, so Steve and I, actually, Steve came to me because we we were deciding on okay, well, what's the topic that we could do for this for the podcast today? And and he he gave me this excellent um, excerpt from uh, Arnold G. Uh, Fruchtenbaum. Yeah, Fruchtenbaum. He's right. a mess- messianic Jew. Mm-hmm. And the book is um, Jesus Was a Jew, and uh, Arnold is the founder of Ariel Ministries, and uh, just uh, a powerful ministry that really witnesses to to Jews especially, but uh, he's got a lot of good stuff. And uh, so he read a chapter of this, this book, Jesus Was uh-huh. a Jew, and thought it, it might be a good topic to talk about. Yeah. You know, you just said that right now, Frutenbaum. Frutenbaum. He's- He's out of San Antonio, Yeah, correct? he is. Yeah. He is. He that is. literally just hit me right now because in a Bible study, uh, Steve Paulson was using his material, yeah. and I thought it was really good. Yeah, I've been on his website Ariel, before. Ariel Ministries. That's him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just such an epic name. It is. That it's like one of those theologian names that just like, yeah, I've heard of that guy. <laughs> You're not going to forget it. It's yeah. not like Smith. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty heavy name. So the, 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 the excerpt from this book is, um, the title is, Why Did the Messiah Have to Die? And it's an excellent question. Excellent question. Um, but before we answer that, um, we, we, it, it also brings up another question, which is, what has God used as a means of redemption? Am mm-hmm. I correct, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. So the first question, why did the Messiah have to die? I mean, the answer to that very clearly from Scripture, from scripture is just to redeem us from our sins. You know, there needed to be that substitute for us. Um, yeah. So today we're going to be talking about specifically God's means of redemption, which is blood. And mm-hmm. yes, blood. And we see blood all throughout the Bible. We see war. We see Mm. death. We see sacrifice. And in the New Testament, we see a heavy emphasis on the blood of Christ. Exactly. And so a lot of people will think of blood as icky. Where does it come from? Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the whole point of this? And if, if you were to read the Torah, the Old Testament, there's a heavy emphasis on blood. So all throughout the Bible, there is a theme of redemption by blood, and that's as a consequence of the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve in paradise. Exactly. And so since then, all of humanity's nature has become corrupt, and all of man has become born into sin. And so... It's very important for Christians, especially unbelievers who are listening to this, is that um, since the fall, since we are radically corrupted by sin, and, and, and it is our nature, there is uh, a necessity for us to be redeemed mm-hmm. because we are separated from God that is equivalent to one person standing on one side of the Grand Canyon and exactly. another person standing on the other side of the Grand, Grand Canyon. Um I've been there, and it is huge. And it's, even that pales in comparison yes. to our separation from our Creator. Yeah, and yeah, that's something that I want to make clear is that, and and um, and yeah, and so even if I were to run, yeah, and try to jump, I wouldn't make it to the other side. It's just, it's just impossible. Exactly. And so there needs to be a bridge in place in order to bridge that gap yep. of our fallen, sinful nature, in order for us to be right with God, and so. That chasm, that means of redemption that we're talking about, was by blood, and it's consistent all throughout the Old and New Testament. And so that's what we see. And uh, and again, since the fall, and because man's uh, nature has been corrupt, the means of, of uh, bridging this great chasm was by the means of blood. So until sin, no blood was necessary. Exactly. But when Adam and Eve fell, we needed to have a way to 
bridge that gap, and that's what happened. That's what we read about in in chapter three of Genesis. Mm-hmm. Genesis. Uh, well, after the uh, after the fall, the uh, the the Lord is walking in in the garden, and and uh, the man called his wife's name Eve, starting in verse twenty of, of mm-hmm. chapter three, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them because hmm. after the fall there needed to be a way they realized their nakedness and they needed to be they needed to have a way of, of being clothed and so even there we see right at the beginning right after the fall there was uh, there was uh, death death entered the world because of sin yeah yeah and it even says that right when the fall happened their eyes were opened and they were they were aware of their nakedness. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about this yesterday, preparing for this podcast. Is I could only imagine how that felt. You know, just like the Heidelberg Catechism says, they were in paradise, mm-hmm. and they they had all the blessings and pleasures of living in this. And they and so what I'm trying to get to is when their eyes were open and when they were aware of their nakedness. It was this experience that they never felt before. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. And the one thing that I could relate it to, this is someone who's who's uh, struggled with anxiety in his life, but has a panic attack. I mean, if whenever you have a panic attack, it's like the emotions and the fear are things that you've never felt before. So I could only imagine this mm. new feeling of your eyes being opened. Mm. Um and and I would say this is what we feel today, right? Absolutely. And we just become completely normalized with it. I think so. And I think that's as we grow in our sanctification as Christians, you know, we become more aware of sin in our lives. But uh, so often because we are in the world and right. it has such an influence on us, um, we can't imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve living without sin whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And uh, then than sinning and falling and and realizing their nakedness and their separation from God. Yeah, and so we have um, also, too, so we have the fall, and we're going to get back to the fall of Adam and Eve in a second, but we also see it in there, uh, in the effects of sin, what what that I just talked about right now, that we're born into sin now as a consequence of the fall, and all mm-hmm. of man is now radically corrupt, and we see it in their first children, Cain and Abel. You want, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. We see... Uh We see Cain and Abel. When Cain and Abel offered their sacrifices to God, uh, Cain offered the fruit of his labors in the field. He offered vegetables, and Abel brought a blood offering to to, uh, the Lord. And Cain's offering was actually rejected. Abel's was accepted by God. God accepted Abel's offering because that was the way that God had ordained uh, him to be approached was through the was, sacrifice, through the shedding of blood. Yeah, through the shedding of blood. And so that that's, again, this we have those two distinctions. We have Cain bringing vegetables as an offering to the Lord, and then we have Abel bringing his first flock, mm-hmm. which was an animal. It was something that, that had blood. But, so let's let's go back. I want to go back to Genesis, Genesis uh, 3. Th- 3, 21. In order to understand the significance of, of verse 21, which says, And the Lord God made uh, Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And so right at the fall, right when their eyes were opened, uh, right when sin came into the world and they were aware of their nakedness, it's in, it's interesting because in Genesis 3, 17, uh, it says, again, their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. And what did they do, Steve? They sewed fig leaves together. Exactly. Plants, something like vegetables, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and, and then, you, then they made themselves loincloths. So you see here the first time that man tries to in his own strength in his own ways in his own thinking Mm -hmm. tries to hide their sin Mm -hmm. tries to hide their nakedness by their own means right and so this we keep again i want i want i want people to understand this this is in verse 17 then we have in verse 21 pretty much god is saying no 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 no. these fig leaves aren't aren't enough right i'm gonna make you garments of skin and so as christians we believe that prior to the fall there was no death Mm mm-hmm and so you have God here killing an animal because of sin because of sin and clothing Adam and Eve with garments of skin. Exactly. And so animals were killed here for the first time with blood mm-hmm. and what that points to here is that that the means of 
atonement or covering of sin is by God. It is. It it, is. He sets the standard. He dictates the means of redemption for us. We can, we can't come to him with our own uh, ideas of how we're going to atone for sin. We have to go back to his word. What does he say what is, is going standard? to be the standard for the the forgiveness of sin? How How is sin atoned for? Yeah, and, and so that goes back, I said it previously, um, um, uh, previously, until sin, no blood was necessary. Mm-hmm. So right when sin happened, we had man try, trying to cover their sin, trying to atone for their sin, their own ways. By We're gonna, the fig leaves. By the fig leaves, uh, plants, and then you have God saying, no, 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 let me cover you with the garment of skin. So you, you have that, and then we see right after in, the, in, in their children, Cain and Abel, the right. same Sort of thing. The same thing. Exactly. And um, Cain decides what he's going to do in order to approach God. And Abel is obedient, and Abel is Abel's sacrifice is, is honored. His offering is honored by God. Yes, and I like how Fruits and Baum puts it, um, Steve. If you could read that of what a, what the atonement means. There's a there's a section in in this excerpt that we're reading that's uh, yeah quite significant. It is <laughs> on atonement. So this is. This is uh, Fruchtenbaum referring to the skins, the animal skins that uh, were used to clothe uh, Adam and Eve after they had fallen. And uh, he says the, the skins were animal skins. The nakedness that the element of sin now revealed needed to be covered. But the covering required the death of several animals. And so, for the mm. first time in history, blood was shed. Yeah. This provides the root meaning of the Hebrew word for atonement, which is covering. I think that's fascinating. (laughs) That blew my mind when I read that. Yeah. I mean, atonement is covering. It's It's it's, it's the covering of Jesus' blood for our sins. That's how we understand it now. Mm -hmm. But way back um, when it was first understood in, uh, when it was first written down in the Hebrew text, in the in the first book of the Bible, mm-hmm. that word signified a covering. Covering was the the word used to atone for sin. Yeah, and so and there's another another um, excerpt from this article that we're reading uh, when Fruitenbaum just says, "So a lesson was taught." And this is something that I want every Christian to hear this, uh, is one cannot approach God mm-hmm. by whatever means one chooses. It is man who sinned and offended the holy God. And here it is. It is God who must do the forgiving. Therefore, it is not for man to choose the means of forgiveness, but for God. And God has chosen the means of blood. Again, going back to blood. Amen. And um, and I think that's just such, that's such a lesson for us, because don't we so often try to do that? I mean, especially be, before becoming Christians, before believing in Christ, we right. try to do that. We try to atone for our own sins through good works or mm-hmm. uh, penance or, um, you know, being generous with with our finances. But none of those things are what God says is going to atone for sin. We need to yeah. have the redemption that is provided through Christ. Yeah. And so well, I, I would like, I just reading this article, you, you, I like to make distinctions. And so you have man's way, <laughs> yeah, which exactly. is Cain, which is Adam and Eve when they first um, saw their sin and they tried to cover it by their own means, their own atonement. Um, and then you have um, God's standard, mm-hmm. which is by blood, his way, and then you have also Abel, uh, Abel knowing that distinction and being obedient and following that. And I guess this is sort of a topic that I kind of want to bring up here because you, you kind of brought it up um, here, which is the exclusivity of Christianity. Mm. A lot of people have a hard time with the exclusivity of Christianity. And we're going to dive into this once we get into the New Testament and the significance of Christ's blood. But there is a certain sacrifice that God has to provide. Mm -hmm. There's a certain blood that needs to be provided, a way that it's done, uh, how it's been done, um, that is sufficient in order for you to be considered right with God. Absolutely. And uh, and a lot of people have heart. A lot of people are... um, or Adam and Eve at the fall. Oh, mm-hmm. if I just do uh, uh, some good works, right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I could, I could, I could look good in, in the eyes of God. I'll make it to heaven there. Exactly. But no, <laughs> that's just that's, throughout throughout yeah. the entire scripture, the entire revelation of of God to us, we see blood as the means of redemption. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, and these are some verses that I, or some aspects, just the back 
back up Steve here, is biblical history of blood as redemption. So um, oh, this is a side note here, Genesis 4.10, when, when Cain kills Abel, and God says, it says here, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have in Genesis 15, God's covenant with Abraham. Uh, we could talk about this in a separate podcast because it would take a lot to unpack, but um, uh, there was a blood sacrifice there. Yeah, and that was very significant, and it was God was the one who walked through that. Exactly, uh, pretty much him um, uh, putting an oath on himself, mm-hmm. something that was eternal and that he was going to get done. And when we get into that in, in, in another podcast, but then you also have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all approaching God by the means of blood, and then we have Moses receiving the law at Mount Sinai. Right, the redemptive element of blood ran through the entire law. Six hundred and thirteen commandments, and yeah. we see that that same theme of the necessity of the shedding of blood for forgiveness of sin. Mm-hmm. So in, in uh, Leviticus 17, mm. it's kind of the focal point with regards to that, that issue. The law, yeah. And uh, we read this. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. Mm. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. I think that's really interesting that God grants atonement through the blood placed on the altar by them. God works atonement for his people Hmm. through their faithful performance of it. You know, those words that he uses, I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement. So even there we see a foreshadowing of that ultimate fulfillment that's going to come in Jesus Christ. God is providing the atonement, but he's he's giving them a means now by which to signify that through the sacrifice of the animals. Yeah, yeah. And then we see also as well in the Old Testament that all seven feasts of Israel, Passover, Passover has a heavy significance on blood. Absolutely it does. And, and Israel was prepared to leave uh, Egypt, and um, obviously we have the, uh, the Holy Spirit coming over and, and and there was a certain death that was there and in order for the Israelites to um, not be a part of the death of the firstborn they mm-hmm. were to uh, kill a lamb mm-hmm. it was um, uh, and put the blood on, on, the on the doorpost so there you get there again you see blood being used as a means of what redemption of God passing over exactly people um, and, and I I think that that is just a really good passage to refer to a minute. Exodus 12, 21 mm-hmm. and 22. It says, this is uh, for the Passover. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. Yeah. You shall take a bunch of hy- hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin mm. and apply some of that blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the doorpost. Yeah. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. Yeah. And so, as you said, we see that that shedding of blood and that putting that blood over the doorpost covered them from covered them. from death that uh, that would come their way. That would come as a judgment upon upon uh, Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, we we also have unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, Day of Atonement, the Tabernacle, all required the shedding. Of blood, exactly. All of it again, God. We're trying to emphasize um, God's means of redemption has always been by blood, and I, this is just one thing I love about the Bible. Side note is this just the consistency. Absolutely, it's amazing. It blows my mind. And just to, I guess, get ahead a little bit, but uh, this isn't in Fruchtenbaum's book, but we see that fulfillment in in the New Testament when Christ celebrates the Passover mm. with his disciples yeah. in Luke 22 it says that uh, he took the he took the bread and he gave thanks he said this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me and mm. then he says in verse uh, in verse 20 it says in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten saying this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood and so here is Christ celebrating the Passover with his disciples and clearly pointing to yeah. himself as the fulfillment of what has been celebrated for thousands of years, yeah. you know, for, for uh, with the Israelite nation, Amen. Uh, celebrating their redemption from Israel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, now we see it fulfilled in Christ. Yeah. And, 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 and so now we have the, the Yom Kippur ceremony. 
uh, that was greatly detailed in Leviticus 16. So, so this is uh, this is from uh, Frutenbaum. So I'm just going to go ahead and quote him here. But he says, um, uh, this is on Yom Kippur, Kippur uh, and, and and this is where careful instructions are given for the shedding of blood to atone for the sins of the Jewish nation. So it's the whole nation. It's a sacrifice that's for uh, an entire people. And the tabernacle and the temple both were built to expedite and to make efficient the required shedding of blood for the atonement of the people's sins. The Holy of Holies, which contained the Shekinah glory, the visible manifestation of the presence of God, could only be entered once a year only by one man Mm -hmm. called the high priest in order for him to enter he had to have uh, the blood of the Yom Kippur sacrifice with him and this blood had to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant which contained the tablets of the law itself and and again all of this has huge we do a whole podcast on this but it's everything here is pointing to Christ amen and uh, even Leviticus 16 do you want to read this sure so he says in uh, Leviticus 16 15 through 17 Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood on the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat Mm -hmm. and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions Mm -hmm. in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. Hmm. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Hmm. And I think the really interesting thing about this is as as well as the not only the detail that they had to go through and the necessity of the shedding of blood, but that this needed to be done year after year, year after yeah. year. You it was know? taxing. It was. And especially for the Jewish people who might not have lived near Jerusalem and didn't have that opportunity to, mm-hmm. to easily get to Jerusalem in order to partake, to be a, 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 a participant in being there when that sacrifice was happening. Yeah, and I liked what you said uh, too earlier about even it was a consistent reminder over and over and over Mm. again how they were just sinners. It was just constantly reminding them that they couldn't do it themselves. Absolutely. And that's yeah, it's it's very powerful. Um, And and there's something here in Fruit and Bombs, uh, the expert that I that I want to read because here we again we see. Um, Adam and Eve trying to atone, going their own way of atoning. We see uh, the the Cain side of man, uh, which is in, in the Old Testament, which is when we had some of the Israelites trying to build their own altars, trying to do it their own way to make their sacrifice right. because they didn't want to make the travel to Jerusalem. Right. And you even had the, the prophets calling mm-hmm. them out and saying, no, yeah. it has to be done a certain way. Exactly. And, and again, all of this is to point to God is very to propri- pri- precise. Yeah. Yeah, there's a way in which he is worshipped. It goes back to what what we just said recently with Fruit and Bombs excerpt. It is not for man to choose the means of forgiveness, but for God. Right. And that just goes back to God being very, very precise. Exactly. And so we see that in these in these sacrifices done every year that uh, that the the people needed to have an a, a some sense some way of atoning for their sins, and it was something that like we said, needed to be done annually. Mm-hmm. And it was only with the coming of the Messiah that we actually have the opportunity for that to be uh, completed, to be fulfilled, to be consummated, so that in Christ, in his one sacrifice, it is once for all. Once for all. Yep. And so this go- this brings us to Isaiah, Isaiah 53. <laughs> Isaiah 53, probably one of the best-known passages of in all of scripture. And Isaiah, I'm going to read from Isaiah 53, 4 4 through 7. Uh Um, He says, uh, the prophet says, Surely our griefs, surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Hmm. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. 
and he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter hmm. and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. That's what Jesus did. Exactly. <laughs> and I mean, isn't that such a, it just, it just points so directly and indisputably to that fulfillment in Christ. You know, I don't know. It's amazing to me that you can miss it. You know, I know it's by the grace of God, but yes. it's amazing that you can miss that. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that Frutenbaum says that the, because the, the Jews expected the Messiah at one point, according to what Frutenbaum is saying. He says at the very, very beginning of, of this excerpt, he says, because the whole concept of a dying Messiah is so foreign to modern Judaism, right. that's today, although once it was part of Jews, Judaism. Exactly. So it was once part. Yep. And it's it's interesting that... Yep. Um, I've read and I've seen some videos that um, Judaism or Jews have taken Isaiah 53 out mm. of the out of their Bible. Sure. Um, and it's interesting because there's a video that's on the internet where they go asking around uh, Jews um, and they start reading this passage and they who does this sound like? And they'll say, it sounds like Yeshua. Yeah, exactly. And it's just clear. It's just so clear, even to even to Jews. And this guy's going around Jerusalem, and he's asking. He's just reading this verse to them. And he's like, "Who does this sound like? Who does this sound like? Who does this sound like?" And they all say, "It sounds like Yeshua." Absolutely, Yeshua. And then he goes, "Well, do you know that this is Isaiah 53?" And they they just don't know because it's not in there. This is how powerful this verse is. It and, and it's. I'll I'll link the, I'll link the video um, in the description below for the podcast so y'all could find it there. It's an excellent video. When I first saw it. I was like, well, that's that's powerful that stuff. Is, it's crazy. It's powerful stuff, yes. Um, so yeah, now we go to the book of Hebrews, right? Yeah. Where exactly. it, where where um it's uh pretty much a counterpart book to Leviticus, correct? Yes, exactly. We see in uh for example, Hebrews nine twenty two is kind of the focal point. Um, of the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And as as Fruchtenbaum says, he says, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is a counterpart of the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. To understand Hebrews, one must first understand Leviticus. And then going to that uh, verse in Hebrews, uh, we have Hebrews 9.22. And the author of Hebrews says this. He says, and according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Mm. I mean, what, that, what does that sound like? It sounds like Leviticus it 17, sounds like, right? But this is New Testament. Exactly. This is New Testament. This is in Hebrews. You, you, the same lingo, blood, redemption, remission, cleansed. Exactly. According to the law. Yeah. Yeah. You can't miss that. No, 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 you can't. You can't miss it. Um, and so we, we just got done with the, the prophecy, uh, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 53, and this is what Fruchtenbaum says. He goes, it picks, up on the, it picks up the theme of Leviticus and the prophecy of Isaiah to show the superiority of the sacrifice of the Messiah. Hmm. A number of passages bring this out. One such passage is Hebrews, again, New Testament. We're not right. talking about Old Testament anymore. We're in the New Testament. Hebrews 2, 16, 18. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Hmm. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things ah. pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Hmm. For since he himself was tempted in that he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid to, of those who are tempted. And so, yeah, so, so Fruchtenbaum says this passage makes the point that Messiah came as a Jew and underwent all the problems that a Jew had to go through in order that he might become a merciful and sympathetic high priest. And so we also have another central passage, which is Hebrews 4, 14, 15. We're just letting Scripture speak for itself. The prophet or the author of Hebrews, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who, can, who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. And that goes back to Jesus, who obviously is without sin, but he was tempted in many ways and never once... Um, sinned exactly I mean. <laughs> yeah i mean we have the assurance that he was in his humanity exactly like us we mm -hmm. uh you know he was one 
one person but two natures. He yeah. had the divine nature, but he also had the human nature. And mm-hmm. in his humanity, he was just like we are. Yeah. And so how about let, let's go ahead and read Hebrews seven twenty two through 25. Yeah, 22 through 25 says, So much more also Jesus. has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forevermore those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hmm. So again, we see the superiority of the priesthood of Christ pointed out by the fact of the mortality of the other priests, yet one high priest would serve that uh, would not be like the rest of the high priests that mm-hmm. came before him. Yeah. One high priest would would die, but he would be raised again to life to live eternally as the, as the final priest. I think it, there's also two powerful significance of because we just read in Leviticus too what the high priest would do that he would have to make atonement for his own sin before going into yeah exactly and and you had Christ who was was what without he was without sin mm-hmm. and so again just pointing to the superiority of Christ as um, the high priest the high priest not exactly. a high priest he is the high priest singular singular. And then there's the Hebrews seven twenty six and 27 passage. Mm-hmm. It says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, mm. who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and yeah. then for the sins of the people, because he did this, how many times? Once for all, oh. when he offered up himself. Yeah. And so again, this this passage just points out to the superiority of Christ as our high priest. All of those other sacrifices had to be re- repeated day in, day out, year in, year out. But when Messiah came, he was offered up once for all as a sacrifice for sin. The, sac- the, the once for all sacrifice for all of those who would believe in him. He offered his own blood as the atonement. Yeah, and that just, that goes, well, us that hold to Reformed theology... Of course, we believe that once you have faith alone, this goes back to the solos. We did a series back in January you could go listen to that fleshes all this out. But, um, yeah, we believe that Christ's sacrifice was once and for all. When he was nailed to the cross, um, our sins were forgiven. And when he was risen, um, we were raised with him as well. And um, once we put our faith, once by God's grace pulls us by the Holy Spirit and draws us to his son, we are saved. Mm-hmm. And so works... Um, and this is another thing we're probably going to have to flesh out, but um, our works don't contribute at all to Absolutely. our salvation or to us um, being holy. Um, they, they come about as a result yes. you know, of that transformation by yeah. God's grace and a mm-hmm. desire to live in a way that pleases him, but certainly do not endear us to God or, mm-hmm. or uh, bring us to salvation. Mm-hmm. So going on to uh, the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, there's a few verses in there again that show the superiority of Christ's sacrifice over all of the sacrifices that happened right. beforehand. It says uh, Hebrews nine eleven through 15. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, Mm. again pointing back to that old covenant covenant system, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all again, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of Mm -hmm. a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. Amen. Eternal redemption. Exactly. <laughs> 
don't need to be repeating it. It's it's good once for all. Once for once all. Once for all time and for all who would believe in him. Yeah, and so I like what Frudenbaum says too. He says, unlike the animal sacrifices, the sacrifice of Jesus was to bring eternal redemption rather than temporary atonement. Furthermore, even after the animal sacrifice, the Jew was still conscious of his sins. Uh, faith in the sacrifice of Jesus, however, brings a complete cleansing of the consciousness of sin. That's that once for all sacrifice. Amen. Uh, and another passage is found in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ also have been once offered to bear the sins of many shall appear a second time apart from sin to to them that wait for him unto salvation. That's mm. talking about the second advent there. Um Anything. Yeah, so no, there we see the the twofold aspect of, of Christ's career. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus came first to be the sin offering for the people, just as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Right. But also, just as the suffering servant was the one who bore the sins of many, Jesus did through his death. And yeah. now we have that, uh, that hope to look forward to. Jesus will come a second time for a different purpose. The purpose of the first coming was to die. The purpose of the second coming will be to establish his messianic kingdom. Yeah, and so and then th- there's another um, contrast for the animal sacrifices and the blood sacrifice of Jesus in Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. Can we read that one? Again, we, we like here to just let Scripture speak just let for, scripture it's, speak. for yeah. itself. Um, Hebrews is such a it's, it's such a, a rich book. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, besides Romans, if I had to choose one <laughs> book out of the New Testament, you know, I mean, I would I would not want to get rid of any of them. But <laughs> Hebrews is so rich because it yeah. just points to Christ as the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies. Yeah, amen. So uh, Hebrews ten one through four for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Mm -hmm. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins." Mm. So, in conclusion, we see that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament sacrifices. That sacrificial system pointed to its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He had to die according to the Old Testament. And that is why Jesus did die according to the New Testament. But the question, I think, is what are you going to do with it? You know, what are we going to do with this information? What are we going to do with Jesus? You know, and the, the question that each one of us, I think, has to wrestle with is, you know, am I going to trust what God's Word has said Mm -hmm. with regards to atonement for sin? Am I going to Am I going to embrace the the free gift of salvation that he has given to me in Christ Jesus and his shed blood on the cross to cover my sin? Or am I going to try to pull myself up by my own bootstraps and do it my own way? Mm-hmm. You know, the, we need to we need to decide, are we going to accept the substitutionary atoning sacrifice of Christ or are we going to do it on our going to try to do it in our own on way? Our own, yeah. Yeah. No. And uh, one of my favorite songs ever. And it always, just the lyrics in general, always just has a, an impact on me. But mm. uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yes. If you if you read those lyrics, it's it's what we're talking about today. Absolutely. And I, I love worship music, and this is a uh, an amazing hymn. But it says, um, "What can wash away my sins?" And the answer is nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can make me whole again? nothing but the blood of Jesus. And then, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. And you have this, like, weird thing of blood that is red. Yes. And you're, it, you're, you're, you're dipped in it, and all of a sudden you come up, not red, but white yeah, as snow. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's, it's, what it's talking about there is that once you were a sinner... Dirty and and it is by the blood of Christ alone. Nothing else is what makes God's wrath veer away from you. And God right. now looks at you as He would look at His own Son as Christ. And so it is it is the blood of Christ only that could make you whole again. That could Amen. make you white as snow. Amen. And and it is only again this goes back to that the Adam and Eve um, of us doing it our own way mm-hmm. of of being Cain and offering giving an offering to God that that isn't according to his standards, by his means. Um, 
and um, it's by Christ and mm-hmm. Christ alone. Mm-hmm. And so, and that just kind of goes back a little bit to what what I was talking about. Um, just the exclusivity of Christianity, the importance of Christianity. Absolutely. Um, and I don't say this to to be rude or mean to, to, to some people, but other religions, you know, like Muhammad, for example, um, he was a sinner. Mm-hmm. He wasn't sinless. Um, even if he did sacrifice himself on the cross, it would be... He was, a, he was no. a sinner. It wouldn't do us any good. It wouldn't do us any good, no. Um, Buddha as well. Yeah. He never did anything to make atonement. He wasn't God. It took God to come down incarnate in the flesh. We needed so, the God man. Yes, we needed the God man to do it. And we needed his blood for redemption. Amen. I love the the uh, picture that we get when we think about blood. You know, it, we, we see both death and life in blood, don't we? We see, yeah. we see death because of its gore, mm-hmm. but life is uh, bl- blood is also life giving yeah. you know it is what we need in order to to live and and Very so true. yes and so we see both aspects in 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 that blood in that concept of blood and i mm-hmm. i just want to close with with uh, a couple of verses from second corinthians 5 20 and 21 mm-hmm. and just really encourage our listeners along with paul who says this he says we implore you on christ's behalf to be reconciled to god For God made him, that is Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that verse just absolutely blows me away. I don't completely, I can't completely wrap my mind around how that could be, that God would put my sin on his precious son, perfect, perfect man, perfect God, and clothe him with my impurity and my sin so that I could be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, that great exchange. It's an amazing, yeah. it's an incredible thing. There's no words to describe no, there it. there isn't. But as I come to appreciate it more, you know, by God's grace, mm-hmm. it comes to change me into a person who wants to, to live yeah. a life that is holy and pleasing to him, not to engender his good favor, but simply out of gratitude for that mercy and the grace and the love that he's shown me. Yeah. And just the the verse that I read, First Peter uh, verses mm. 16, uh, 17 through 19, and go back and read those, but it said, like, you weren't purchased with silver and gold, these perishable things, but with the precious, the precious blood, blood. blood of Christ. And I've always thought, and I've to myself is you know the the sins that I commit on a daily basis were paid for 2,000 years ago on a right. cross mm-hmm. by God himself in real history in real history and and he resurrected from the dead and again I was I was raised with him there completely undeserving right I did not deserve that I didn't and so when I walk in my Christian how the way this impacts my life looking at the blood of Christ is you know, when I sin, is it, there needs to be a repentance. Mm-hmm. There needs to be a contrition of, of my sin because it was paid for right. by the precious blood of Christ. And, and me continuing and loving my sin and continuing to walk, I'm trampling on the work of Christ. Exactly. I'm taking it for granted. Yeah. Well, I that, am. That's where we see the two sides of that, that, that coin of faith and repentance, right? Yeah. In true faith, there is also the desire for repentance, yeah. for turning away from sin, and mm-hmm. not continuing to walk in that lifestyle. Yeah. Any so, last thoughts? No, I mean, good stuff. We could go on and on. But we can't. There, there's so much to cover here. Yeah, but uh, we're not going to do another two hours like John Sampson. No. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that wraps up this this episode. This was kind of a spontaneous podcast because we we didn't have a guest. We're, I think we're going to be getting uh, Eric Hernandez on to talk about apologetics next week. Uh, the following week, um, I believe we're getting John Sampson back again for part two, or if not, Costi Hin, which is Benny Hin's. Uh, I believe it's his nephew. That's going to be good. Yeah. So we um, sent him out an email, and uh, and we're we're going to be preparing for April, guys. And then um, we got the doctrines of grace coming up. Yeah, that's 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 the doctrine of grace who, in April. Who do we have again for that? <laughs> John Sampson. John Sampson. Beaky. Joe Joel Beaky. Um, Jeff Durbin. James White. Tim Trumper. Tim Trumper and John Frame. Is going to start it, kick it all off for us. So. Yeah, it's going to be good, guys. Hey, if you like this podcast, like and share. Um, share it around, especially this topic. Very powerful. 
um, again, we let Scripture speak to itself. And um, though there was a, a range of rabbit trails we could have gone on, if, if you want us to clarify some stuff, hey, so shoot us an email. Absolutely. Uh, at uh, juliobridgemin at gmail.com. If you have a question, hey, we'll address it here on the program uh, concerning this podcast. So um, anyway, guys, as always, love your neighbor as you love yourself and love the Lord God with all your strength, mind, heart, and soul. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.